Hey gang, just me today. Sorry, PJ couldn't be here, so you just got me, Matt. Um, today, or this video rather, this video is going to talk about science objectives, potential science objectives for you guys. Um, the most, or the the first step in the Inspires process is for you guys to come up with your science objective. Um, basically, this defines the rest of the semester for you. The science objective uh, will just will define what basically what your payload looks like, um, how your payload functions, what it does, stuff like that. The science objective will also seep into the, uh, it'll become a part of the marketing scheme and become a part of the communication. So basically, your entire team uh, and, 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 and the rest of what you do this semester hinges on this science objective. So it's kind of important. Uh, we're leaving the science objective up to you. Some of the teachers may uh, have recommendations or want you to, to do certain objectives, that's, that, that's up to each individual class. We're not going to get in the way of that. Um, but for our purposes, we want you guys to uh, choose a science objective that, that interests you. Um, again, the teachers may uh, decide differently on this, that's, that's totally up to them. So um, th this video is going to is going to go over some science objectives, some potential interesting things that are going to happen during this mission. And, um, and some things that you could look at. And we're also gonna talk about things, ways for you to measure these interesting things. How would you actually measure them? What instruments would you use? Stuff like that. So um, it's a long video. There's some charts. Obviously, it's just gonna, this video is gonna be me standing next to this plasma TV the whole time. I hope to make it interesting. I'll do my best. I might pull up some props. I don't know, here's an eraser. It's a good prop. Um, so, uh, but, um, the purpose of this video, I'm going to go fast, okay? So you can stop it and rewind or whatever you, you know, you can pause it and rewind or whatever. So, um, if you miss something, you can go back to it. Because if I went slowly, this would take forever. This is a long, got a lot of information here. Um, these charts uh, that are on this plasma right here, they are, um, they're also online on the Inspires website on the downloads page. There's a, there'll be a PowerPoint file and a PDF file if you, if you don't have PowerPoint. Um, you're not meant to just look at these charts on this video. Uh, please download the charts and, and go along with me as I go through the as I go through the presentation on the video. You can go through it on your computer with the PowerPoint or with the PDF. Um, just makes it easier that way, so you can look at everything. There's some small text on here. Uh, anyway, so without further ado, I'm going to jump right into this. Um, well, here's some more ado. Um, so we're going to go over some potential science objectives. We got about 20, a little bit more than 20 of them. Uh, we're going to talk about a few instruments that you could use to, to uh, measure those different objectives, to, to uh, satisfy those objectives. And then we're going to talk about some issues with some of the objectives, some of the measurements, stuff like that with, for each of these. Um, so first we're going to have our, first we'll go over the baseline mission. This is the mission that, uh, you, can that you can go ahead and assume is going to be, um, that you can design to essentially. Um, each of the UAH teams will have a slightly different mission because they because they have different science objectives on Enceladus. However, each of the UAH teams will be will have the same basic mission and that's what we're going to talk about here is the same their basic mission um, and that you can design to. Um, there'll be some minor differences at the end when they get to Enceladus but for the most part it's the same. Um, and you can just uh, any, any differences at Enceladus for a UH team, you can just assume that away. Don't worry about it. We'll talk about that if you have any questions. Um, potential science objectives. And as we go through the objectives, you'll, you'll realize that there's, that there's categories of objectives that um, you can measure something. You can measure the same thing at different places. Um, that's, and, and so that's what we mean by categories. We'll show you that in a second. And then we'll explain the science objectives. We'll talk about the next steps, what you're going to do next. And then we're going to show you this, the science traceability matrix. The science traceability matrix and there's something called the instrument matrix. Those are the two things, the two end products, you know, the two things you want to get done for this science portion of Inspires. Once you have those two things done, then you can, you know, you know, you can just head out with the engineering and go crazy. Um, we want to get this, this science portion done in two or three weeks. Uh, we don't want to spend too much time on it. We've had teams that spent a lot of time on it in the past and they had great science, but the engineering was kind of lacking. Um, so uh, 
that's what this video is supposed to help you with is to get you you know give you a jump start on the science so you can jump into it get your science objective get your instruments and then boom you can start with the engineering that's the idea behind this um, okay so the baseline mission this is the mission that that uh, you guys can assume each each UH IPT will have because they will have this baseline mission and if you have any questions or um, if you want to deviate from this talk to us talk to your team we'll work it out don't worry so basically uh, we talked about this in the introduction video too, the same chart actually. Uh, Saturn Enceladus is a very, is a, is, a, is a long way off, okay? Um, so we have to have a lot of energy to get there, but we don't have, you know, we, we don't have space cruisers or whatever like in Star Wars or Star Trek or anything. We have these, we have launch vehicles and very small spacecraft. Hopefully we've come to your class and showed you the launch vehicle and the small spacecraft that are inside. Um, but uh, we don't have as much energy, we don't, we don't have endless energy like they do on TV. So in order to get to places in the outer atmosphere, or outer atmosphere, sorry, outer solar system, past Mars, we have to do flybys, okay? Um, and the flybys give us energy. We're stealing momentum during a flyby, or we're giving momentum back. It depends on the, it's kind of flyby. So we take off from Earth, we do two flybys of Venus to, to gain momentum. We steal Venus's momentum. We also steal some momentum from Earth. Don't worry about it. They're not, we're not going to miss it. Venus won't miss it. Don't worry about that. It just gives us enough energy, momentum, is mass times velocity, right? So big planet, you know, has a turning, you know, has a rotation, a velocity associated with it. Very small spacecraft mass comes by, takes a little bit of momentum, doesn't change the mass of the spacecraft, change the velocity of the spacecraft, make it go faster. That's how this works. So we go faster and faster, then we go woo, and get flung out past Mars, past the asteroid belt, even past Jupiter. Um, and then we first encounter the Saturn system. Saturn, Saturn is a system. It's a big planet, really big planet, second largest planet. Um, it's got a bunch of moons, it's got a bunch of rings, you know, so it's a, we, we call it the Saturn system. The first thing in the Saturn system that we encounter is Rhea. It's a small moon uh, further out than, than Enceladus, but that's where we do some flybys. So we, we've, we've gained energy with doing flybys at Venus and, we fl and it flung us out to uh, the outer solar system. Now we have to slow down, or we're going to just fly right by. We don't want to fly right by, you know, all that effort to do this. So we have to give energy back. We have to give momentum to Rhea and to Saturn, and then to Dione, which is another moon we'll do flybys. We do 30, 30, 3 zero flybys of Rhea. Flyby Rhea and Saturn, Rhea and Saturn, and we just slow down each time. We do 13, one, three flybys of Dion, Rhea, or I'm sorry, Dion and Saturn, Dion and Saturn, just to continue doing flybys. Uh, so Saturn, between Dion and Rhea, we have 43 flybys of Saturn. So um, we'll actually have another couple of flybys of Saturn as we slow down to orbit Enceladus. And so each of these flybys of Rhea and Dion, we fly by at 200 kilometers. That's the altitude from the surface of the planet to where our spacecraft is. So that's how far above the surface we'll be. Um, and then once we achieve orbit around Enceladus, we're, we're at a 200 kilometer orbit. So uh, that's, again, that's the, from the surface of the planet to uh, where our spacecraft is, that's the altitude. That's where the spacecraft will be. That's how far above the surface of the planet will be, 200 kilometers. Um, so from this baseline mission, what you guys can do, uh, you know, what, what does this mean to you? means you can do science at several different places. You can do, you, you can do science at Venus. Uh, we fly by Venus twice at about 1,550 kilometers, 1,545, 1,550 kilometers, pretty high up there. We fly by Rhea and Dione a bunch of times. Uh, we fly by Saturn a bunch of times. Saturn's flybys are at 82,000 kilometers, not very close to Saturn because Saturn's so big. Can't get too close, you get sucked in. Um, and then we we eventually go into orbit around Enceladus, and then we eventually land on Enceladus. So you can do science at Venus, Rhea, Dion, Saturn, or Enceladus. And you can do science from the orbit of Enceladus, or you can do science on the surface with the lander as it, as it descends down to the surface of Enceladus. Or you can go all the way to the bottom, you know, land on Enceladus, and then do something. That you have, but, but remember, part of your requirements, you have to, part of your payload, part of something that measures on your payload has to separate from the rest, from the spacecraft. Um, so even if you land with us on uh, Enceladus, you have to get thrown off or something once we land. We'll talk about that too. Uh, <clears throat> so, 
Potential science questions. We, as, as I said, we go by Venus, Rhea, Dion, Saturn, and then Enceladus. So those are, but those are potential locations where you could uh, do some interesting science. You could, your science objectives could be at those locations, and that's how I have this broken down. Uh, Venus, Rhea, Dion, Saturn, and Enceladus. It's got a lot of Enceladus because that's where our primary mission is. Now, the UEH primary mission at Enceladus is to look for biologicals. Um, there. That's their main thing, is to look for biologicals. They'll, they'll sample Enceladus, they'll do different things with Enceladus, but their main purpose is to look for biologicals or the signs of any signs of life on or near Enceladus. Um, you can, you can do that, you, you can do something similar to that if you want to, or you can do something completely different. You can do something in Venus if you want to. Your science objective does not have to be tied to the UH objective at all. You can make it complementary uh, to the UH objective, or you can just make it completely different. It's up to you. So, um, at Venus, Venus is the hottest planet. A little trivia there. It's not Mercury. Mercury's the closest, but Venus is the hottest. Venus has this greenhouse thing going on. Um, you can look at uh, atmospheric compositions, or you can look at uh, atmospheric properties. As we fly by, the flybys of Venus are going to be on the order of hours. Um, so you won't have much time if you do something at Venus. That's why we've restricted it to atmosphere only. Um, uh, again, Venus is, uh, Venus's atmosphere is it's not a great place. You wouldn't want to live there. Um, it's really, really hot once you get to the surface. There's parts of the atmosphere that'll, that are sulfuric acid. They've got sulfuric acid clouds. Um, really high pressure when you get down in the atmosphere. Really high pressure, really hot acid. So it's, again, not a great place. You wouldn't want to live there. Not, and you wouldn't even want a vacation there. Um, but it's very interesting to scientists because uh, it's a big greenhouse and scientists want to know if that kind of stuff could ever happen on Earth, essentially. Um, so studying Venus has become very, has become very important to scientists. Uh, Rhea, Rhea, again, it's a, it's a, it's a moon of uh, Saturn, um, and it's, it's, out, it's further out than Dione and Enceladus. Uh, you could look at atmosphere, or they call it an exosphere, actually. Rhea has a, it's a really thin atmosphere, and, they, and scientists call it an exosphere because it's so thin. It's not really thick enough to be considered an atmosphere. Um, so it, this thing exists. Um, uh, scientists don't know. They've uh, Cassini is a spacecraft that's in the Saturn system right now. Um, it actually, it has a flyby of Titan next month in February. Um, but it's looked at Rhea, it's looked at Dion, it's looked at Saturn, it's looked at Enceladus, Cassini has. If you want to start looking at some stuff, start looking at Cassini. Um, but uh, anyway, so Cassini has done a flyby of Rhea, and, and, and it detected certain um, elements in its uh, uh, in its exosphere. And scientists don't know how or why some of these elements got there. So they uh, they can, they they can't explain all the parts of the of, of the exosphere. Um, they don't know where they came from. That's kind of interesting. It's a mystery. Uh, mysteries are interesting to me. Um, uh, internal structure. The internal structure of a planet uh, or a moon basically mean you know, what does it look like? You know, Earth has, you know, we say Earth has the crust, the mantle, and then the core, the molten core. That's Earth's internal structure. Um, scientists want to know the internal structure of every planet and every moon in the solar system. They don't even know the internal structure of our moon yet. So um, this is a big deal internal structure is for scientists. And actually, um, and I know you guys have heard about this because it's a big debate, a really hot topic right now. There's a debate about the internal structure of Rhea. Yes, I know. It's been going on. It's been raging since the mid-2000s, like 2006, 2007. Scientists have been debating about Rhea's internal structure for a long time. Um, the thing is, is Cassini did some flybys of, of Rhea, and it measured different densities. And um, so some scientists believe that Rhea is homogeneous. It's the same thing all the way through. It's a big block of ice, essentially. Some scientists believe that Rhea is, um, has an ice on the, on like an outer ice shell, but inside it's a rock, it's a rock core. Um, and some scientists even believe that Rhea has an, has a, uh, an ocean deep down inside, and, uh, you know, has a, uh, a liquid core, um, whether it's an ocean like a magma or a, like a water ocean, I don't know. But, um, so yeah, it's a really, Big debate. I'm sure you guys have heard about it on on TV, on the internet, and stuff. Huge, huge debate. You know. So uh, yeah. So uh, you could be part of that. You could help to solve that. That'd be awesome to determine the internal structure. We'll tell you how to do that uh, in a, here here in a bit in the presentation. Uh, rings. Rhea, during one of the flybys with Cassini, Cassini thinks 
Their scientists think that Cassini detected rings around Rhea. That is cool. If if Rhea has rings, it'll be the only moon, or the first moon that they've discovered that has rings in our solar system. Uh, again, very cool. Uh, um, so you could look, you could uh, do more tests to determine if there are rings around Rhea. You know, how do you how do you test for rings? You know, rings are essentially uh, ice and dust and stuff that are that are revolving in, in, in specified bands around something. You know, so um, like Saturn's got rings. Everyone's seen Saturn rings. But uh, if Rhea had rings, that would be really cool. They've never seen rings on on, on a moon yet, uh, and uh, you could be, you could uh, that could be your science objective to to to, do, to look into the rings of you know the rings at Rhea. There's some alliteration there too. Um, so Dion, Dion's next. Uh, again, just like Rhea, Dion has an exosphere. You can look at Dion's exosphere. Um, uh, Cassini, de Cassini detected that uh, it had ionized oxygen in the um, in the uh, exosphere of Dion, but scientists don't know how it got there. So, uh, um, so that's a that's a mystery again, a mystery. Scientists don't know where that came from. Um, there's other elements that, and they want to go back and see if it's consistent, if the exosphere is consistent, or if it's got spots that have more ionized hydrogen, um, oxygen, or whatever. So, um, interesting stuff. Surface composition on Dion, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Dion is a really uh, interesting moon. Uh, um, it's tidally locked. Most of these, Rhea, Dion, and actually Enceladus too, are tidally locked to Saturn. Our moon, um, the one that you see every night, or most every night, is, is tidally locked to Earth. Tidally, tidally locked, tide, like tidal, like tide, not like, you know, like roll tide, but like the tides in the ocean and stuff. Tidally locked means that means that it rotates and it revolves at the same uh, rate. So that basically one side always faces um, the planet that it's um, going around. Okay, so uh, so our moon, you know, we we basically only see one side of our moon. There is no dark side to our moon. With all due respect, it's a great song. I love it, but. Um, there's no dark side to our moon. There's just a front side and a back side to our moon. So basically, tightly locked is like this. So if my head is Earth or Saturn or whatever, um, and my fist is the moon, basically it means that as the Earth rotates, the moon goes around it just like this, and it rotates and it revolves such that one side always faces, okay? And so if the camera, if you guys are the sun, right now the far side of the moon is, is getting sunlight, right? And so we don't see the front side because the far side's getting sunlight, and so it's like it's, it's a new moon, essentially. And then as you go this way, you get like a half moon jobby going on because sunlight's on this side, right? And it's reflecting, you know, the moon doesn't have its own light. It just reflects sunlight. And then so as you go around, the sun's really big, so it would illuminate this. You get a full moon at this point, and then another half moon, you know, or whatever they call that quarter moon, I think. And then, uh, and then boom, we're back to a new moon. Uh, so that is tightly locked. One side always faces. Now Dion is interesting because, uh, and then, okay, with tightly locked you have a, a leading side and a trailing side. So if, if this is the moon, now, now my head's Saturn, okay? We're changing gears. Now my head is Saturn and this is my fist is Dion. And so if it's going like this, this is the leading side. This side of my fist is the leading side. And then this side with my thumb is the trailing side. So it goes like this. Again, tightly locked. So, uh, Dion is interesting because the leading side covered, covered with uh, impact craters all over the place, on top of each other, everywhere, big, small, whatever, blah, 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 covered with them, okay? On this side, on the leading side. The trailing side, not so much. Very, very few impact craters, and, uh, but it's got these cliffs, um, icy cliffs and stuff um, on the trailing side. Uh, there are a few impact craters and they're quite large on the trailing side. So what scientists actually believe is that at some point in Dion's history that it was going, that it was traveling like this and it got hit with something so hard that it went whoop and just twisted. Scientists think that Dion got, it didn't go that fast, it probably took it a long time, but they think that Dion got turned essentially, which is really kind of neat and weird. Um, at the same time. But, uh, so that's an interesting thing to look at. That, that would be an internal structure issue. You could, uh, you could look at surface composition also. You could look at uh, the age of the, um, of the stuff that's on the surface. 
and what stuff there is on the surface. You can tell if it's, I mean, I mean, is the stuff on the surface, is it from other bodies? If it's, is it from meteors or is it from, is it just from, you know, when Dion was made up, you know, that kind of thing. That surface composition, internal structure could tell you, are there any large cracks? I mean, did Dion suffer from a, a really huge seismic event sometime in the past? That kind of thing. <clears throat> so Dion's really interesting that way. <clears throat> Excuse me. Scientists also, in, in, internal structure wise, scientists also cannot explain why Dion is, uh, is as dense as they think it is. Um, again, uh, Cassini flew by, did some density measurements. They basically, they just use gravity. They, you know, they feel the pull from the planet on the, uh, on the uh, spacecraft and they try to determine density from that. Um, so, uh, scientists think that they're like, whoa, this density doesn't make sense for this planet. So, um, so they're scratching their head trying to figure out what's going on with that. So again, internal structure, what is the, is the inside of Dion just really, really dense or is it made up of something that is fooling the sensors? They don't know. Um, so that's Dion. Uh, Saturn. Saturn's a really interesting big planet, second largest planet in the solar system, sixth planet out there from the sun. Saturn is, um, Earth is one astronomical unit, one AU from the sun. It's just we made it one AU. You know, we, we defined what an AU was. So we said Earth is one AU. Saturn is about 10 AU. So it's about 10 times the distance from the sun um, as Earth is, which is neat because it makes the math easy. Um, so therefore it, it receives about one one hundredth of the amount of sunlight that, that Earth sees, um, that Earth feels and sees energy from the sun because it's a, it's a square law type deal. Um, so that's, that's where Saturn is. Saturn is a gas giant. Um, doesn't mean that it ate Taco Bell. It means that it, uh, it, it, uh, it's basically a big ball of gas, um, mainly hydrogen and helium. The, at, at the very, very core, the very, very deep, 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 deep inside, they think it might have a solid core. They're not sure. Uh, they think somewhere down in there that the hydrogen um, gets so hot and has so much pressure that it turns to um, metallic hydrogen you know it's not, I don't know how that even happens but you know at some point that the pressure and temperatures are so high that the hydrogen just turns to metallic um, but again it's it's classified as a gas giant Jupiter is a gas giant um, Saturn Uranus uh, though they're, they're gas giants big planets essentially big balls of gas on the outside lots of lots of uh, gas so atmosphere obviously with a gas giant atmosphere is a big deal um, you can measure atmospheric composition and properties What's in the atmosphere? What are the properties of the atmosphere? Um, Saturn, uh, excuse me, it's, it's uh, atmosphere is interesting because it's, it's, one of the, it's the only planet in the solar system that has a density less than that of uh, water, which means that the atmosphere on the outside, really, really low density because on the inside it gets very dense and really, really hot. So the outside has to be really, really very low density in, in order for the inside to be as high dense, you know, as, as dense as it is, and still the whole planet be less dense than water. It's an average thing, is what I was talking about. Um, so, uh, um, it's also interesting. The uh, Saturn, like I said, Saturn is about ten times the distance uh, from the sun as the Earth is. But uh, so the energy that it receives from the sun is not that much. But it, Saturn itself, releases two and a half times the amount of energy that it receives from the sun. So um, it releases its own energy, and scientists don't know where that's coming from exactly. Um, it's coming out of Saturn, you know, it's kicking it out everywhere, and uh, that um, that energy release plays a big part in in some of the other objectives here, and and how Saturn behaves in some respects too. Um, for example, Saturn has wind speeds. Cassini and I think Voyager also recorded wind speeds on Saturn up to. Um, I think the highest wind speed was 1120 miles an hour, 1120 miles per hour, very fast winds. Um, again, because it's got a bunch of energy inside, it's releasing the energy, it's, got a, it's, it's a gas giant, so it's a big ball of atmosphere, essentially. And so, really high winds, um, stuff going on there, really, really interesting stuff. Um, Jupiter, y'all heard of Jupiter, right? Okay. Uh, it has the, the big storm on it. They call it the Great Red Spot. Saturn has the Great White Spot. Uh, not as big as Jupiter's. It's, uh, Saturn's is about the size of Earth, maybe a little bigger than Earth. Um, but it's basically, it's a big storm. Saturn's Great White Spot, Jupiter's Great Red Spot has been there as far as, you know, as, 
for human recorded history. We don't know how far back it goes. Um, Saturn's great white spot, it is periodic. It occurs about roughly every 20 to 30 years. Um, it was going every 30 years for a long time, and then one time it showed up about 10 years early, and scientists are going, what? Uh, but we had Cassini up there, so they were like, sweet, we can look at it now. Um, the next time the storm is supposed to occur is between 2020 and 2030. Uh, our, the UAH conceptual mission to Saturn, or to, to Enceladus, arrives at the Saturn system at 2025. So, right in the middle of 2020 and 2030. So we're right poised in the middle to see that white spot. So if you want to look at the great white spot on Saturn, and uh, we don't know much about it at all. We know it's a storm. Uh, we don't know why it's white. <laughs> and um, Cassini's done remote measurements, but it's an interesting thing, and it's happened so infrequently that it's really difficult for scientists. The last time that, I mean, we got lucky the last time that scientists um, were able to uh, do a flyby of it and measure it with Cassini. We got lucky, essentially. So, because um, it occurred 10 years earlier than we thought it would. So, uh, great white spot. Again, supposed to be there between 2020 and 2025. We're supposed to be in the Saturn system at a, at a, sorry, between, this is supposed to occur between 2020 and 2030. We're supposed to be at the Saturn system around 2025. Sort of puts us right in the middle there. We should be able to see it. Um, and, and it would be a really interesting, an interesting thing to look at, especially because it's so infrequent. It happens so infrequently. Um, the North Pole of Saturn uh, has a really strange cloud formation. Um, there's these, uh, at the North Pole of Saturn, the clouds are in the shape of a hexagon. And you can actually see it. Look, on, look online, you can see pictures of it. Cassini's taken pictures, Voyager took some pictures, I think, too. And uh, they're in the shape of a hexagon, you know, a six-sided figure. And scientists have no idea. They're like, they don't know what's going on. Inside the hexagon, there's other cloud formations, too, but there's a defined, a definite hexagon there. And it's been there for as long as we've seen, you know, lo lo looked at the North Pole of Saturn. So they don't know what's going on. Is it, is it an energy release? Is it something to do with magnetic fields? They don't know what's going on there. But it's really cool. It's a mystery. I think it's awesome. And it's just one of those things that, you know, one of the weird things in our solar system that scientists can't explain yet. So it's uh, ripe for, uh, you know, for you guys to look at for a science objective. By the way, any of these science objectives that I'm going to talk about, any of them are... Um, are great science objectives. Uh, you can't go wrong with any of these, basically. Uh, and there's others, too, that I haven't thought of. If you want to come up with your own, by all means, please come up with your own. Uh, the, uh, we know so little about our solar system. Anything you do out there could be, would be beneficial. So don't think that you want to come up with something so interesting and unique that you spend half a semester looking for it. That's not what we want to do. We want to nail this down the next two or three weeks, okay? So, um, uh, that's why I kind of brought these up because kind of just this will help you get along, you know, get started. Um, but, if you, but if you want to come up with something on your own, again, it's up to your teacher um, how you do a lot of this. But, uh, go, you know, go for it. So, last thing about Saturn and the most, and the thing that everyone thinks of when they think of Saturn are the rings. Um, Saturn's got rings, big rings coming out from Saturn. Um, so, you could look at the rings. And we've, we've done a good job. We've cataloged the rings. There's A through E. The E ring is kind of diffuse and kind of really long and not really well defined. But, uh, you know, the A ring is really there. You can see it and everything. So, um, but the rings of Saturn, what are they made of? Are they former moons that just got squished by Saturn's gravity and then they just got flung out, you know, like a ceiling fan type deal? You know, um, is it... Are they asteroids? Was it a planet or something that got too close to Saturn and got chomped on? Who knows? Uh, you guys could look at it. You could uh, do compositional tests. You could do properties of the of the rings. You know, we know we we got information on how wide the wing the how wide the wings how wide the rings are this way coming out from Saturn. But what about how thick they are, the depth or whatever dimension you want to call that? Fly through them that way. Be some interesting stuff. Um, so looking at Saturn's rings would be interesting. So again, these are all getting us to Enceladus. We got Venus, Rhea, Dion, and Saturn. All the, all these are flybys. Um, I mentioned surface stuff, internal structure, and surface stuff on Rhea and Dion because we're going to do so many flybys of them. You could uh, you could do some surface stuff 
you'd have to drop off the orbiter, obviously. You'd have to drop off the spacecraft and hit the surface of the planet, obviously, in order to do surface stuff. But because we're going by so many times, there would be time for, you, for the spacecraft to come back and collect the data. We'll talk more about the details later, but I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. So, uh, Saturn surface is too deep, too far away. We don't even know if it exists, really. So, uh, Enceladus. Enceladus, we're going to capture into a 200 kilometer circular orbit around Enceladus, and then we're going to land on Enceladus. So you can do something, you can do something from orbit, you can fall from orbit, you can fall from the lander as it's descending, you can fall from the lander once it hits the ground, once it's stationary and steady, you can get shot off, or whatever you want to do. Um, so, uh, so, Enceladus, surface composition and properties and age. Encel Enceladus is, uh, sorry, it's, uh, the, it's a weird moon because the, uh, the age of the surface of the moon is drastically different. The, uh, the South Pole is much, much younger than the North Pole, um, like by millions and millions of years. Scientists have, have aged uh, material on the South Pole to be about a thousand, so, you know, some of it as young as a thousand years old. That's very young for, um, for stuff on a moon, a thousand years. And then the North Pole, they've got stuff that's as old as a billion years old. So, um, again, big age difference there. Also, the North, the North Pole and the South Pole are chemically different, meaning that um, much different stuff at the South Pole than you have at the North Pole um, at on Enceladus. Uh, uh, the internal structure, of Enceladus, it's uh, um, what's going on inside Enceladus. Uh, we'll talk about the cryovolcanoes in a minute, but what is going on inside of Enceladus that makes these cryovolcanoes? Um, what does the inside look like? It is a, does it have a, uh, a molten core? Does it have a, a water core? What does it have? Um, and uh, does it experience tidal heating? Does it have a subsurface ocean? Tidal heating is... Uh, um, you ever taken a paper clip and take a paper clip and you just go, you just bend it several, th you know, boom, 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 keep bending your paper clip, right? And eventually it'll break, right? But before it breaks, it gets really hot because you're adding energy to the paper clip in order to break it. But before it breaks, it gets hot and you can touch that, that, that point where you've been bending it a lot and it's, and it's hot. That's, um, the same thing happens with moons, with, with moons that are going around large planets. Um, if this is Enceladus, this balloon's Enceladus, as Enceladus goes around, um, or any moon rather, that experiences tidal heating, um, you know, the moons that are really close in experience it more because they're so close. Uh, um, as it goes around Saturn, it's being squeezed and squeezed and squeezed and squeezed, and it's just being, uh, uh, so that heats up the inside of the planet. And, but is that happening on Enceladus is the first question. Boom. Is that happening um, is the first question. The second question is to, to what degree is that happening? They don't, scientists don't know. So, um, and does it have a subsurface ocean? These are all internal structure questions. Tectonics. Tectonics is the very slow movement of plates on a planet, right? Plate tectonics on Earth, we've heard of that, you know, you know, creates earthquakes and stuff like that in California. Um, so, Tectonics is a very long time frame type thing, uh, but we'll be at Enceladus long enough to perhaps observe something like that. So if you wanted to look at tectonics, scientists think that tectonics exists, exists on Enceladus, but they haven't been there long enough to, 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 to actually measure it. So this could be an opportunity to measure tectonics because uh, we're there for such a long time. We're there for on the order of a few years. Um, magnetic fields, uh, again, Enceladus, and I mean, and Enceladus essentially uh, it creates its own magnetic field because it has, it has, it, excuse me, its cryovolcanoes shoot ions out of it, and it's going through the the magnetosphere of Saturn, and so that creates a magnetic field around it, and it's it induces a magnetic field rather. Um, so you can measure that. You can measure the interaction of the magnetic field on Enceladus versus Saturn. Uh, Saturn's got a pretty decent magnetosphere. It's the second largest in the solar system, second only to Jupiter. Um, so uh, that, um, that's an interesting thing to do is the magnetic field because there's, a, there's an interesting interaction between Saturn and Enceladus. We'll talk about it in a minute. Um, and then again, Enceladus has an a atmosphere and the atmosphere of Enceladus is inconsistent. Um, 
Uh, it's thicker at the South Pole than it is at the North Pole, and it's chemically different at the South Pole than it is at the North Pole, just like the surface. So, um, this is interesting stuff to scientists. Scientists, I mean, whenever there's inconsistencies like that, scientists want to measure it and know more about it, know what causes it. And you can measure the properties of the atmosphere, the composition, um, and the variations, how it, how it changes as you go from place to place. Is it a um, is it just the South Pole that's different and the rest of the planet is the same? Or is it a gradual change throughout the entire planet? How does it work? How does that work with the atmosphere? Um, all right. Most scientists, when you talk to most scientists about Enceladus, they immediately jump to the tiger stripes. The tiger stripes, there are four fissures, four large cracks at the South Pole of Enceladus that scientists have nicknamed the tiger stripes because scientists like to be dramatic. Uh, rah. So tiger stripes, they're, um, essentially there's these fissures at the south pole of Enceladus, and they're cryovolcanoes out from these large cracks, these tiger stripes, out uh, the plumes of cryogenic material. That's why they're cryovolcanoes. They're not regular volcanoes like we have with magma. They shoot out cryogenic material. And cryogenic material just basically means frozen, very cold stuff. Um, so uh, water ice, uh, some salts, stuff like that. Even maybe some biologicals in this stuff. So they don't know, but that's what um, that's what these things shoot out. The coral volcanoes, the tiger stripes. They're warmer than the rest of the planet. They're really interesting. They don't, scientists do not know what's going on with these things, and they're really fascinated by them. So you can measure the composition and the properties of the actual surface around the tiger stripes of the tiger stripes themselves, not the plumes coming out of the tiger stripes, but the Tiger stripes themselves, because some of the stuff that comes out of the plume is going to settle back down around it. So you could measure that. You could go around it, measure the tiger stripes, measure the plumes, measure, you know, go inside of a um, of a fissure, outside of a fissure, see if there's differences, that kind of stuff. Really kind of neat stuff. Again, composition and properties. We'll talk about what those are in a minute too. Temperature and heat flow. We'll talk about what heat flow is in a minute, but. Um, Again, the uh, scientists think that the South Pole is warmer than the rest of the planet, and you can look at that. Uh, why is it warmer than the rest of the planet? The heat source, is it radiation? Is it tidal heating, like I talked about earlier? Is it um, something different? Is there like, is it like Middle Earth with some you know, warlocks or whatever inside with some fire? I don't know. So what is going on inside, the, inside of Enceladus that creates this heat at the South Pole um, near the Tiger Stripes? And then are there biologicals? That's the one that the UAH teams are looking at. Um, you can look at it too if you want. You can be complimentary to theirs. You can be like a backup or a, uh, you know, like a, you know, you, you always wanted to have, if you discover, hey, look, an alien, you want to have someone else say, yeah, I discovered it too. Because they don't want, you know, because you know, they think you're crazy otherwise. So it'd be a double check uh, for biologicals if you search for biologicals. And then there's the plume itself. There's, this, there's the, the material, the gas, the chunks, the, the particles of ice, salts, and whatever else is coming out of these tiger stripes. You could analyze that. You could uh, look at the composition, which is, um, you know, what, are the, what is it composed of? And then the properties, you know, velocities, temperatures, pressures, stuff like that. We'll talk about those in a second, too. So before we move forward, uh, I'm going to take a drink real quick. Uh, excuse me. Before we move forward, um, I want everyone to notice that for each of the planets, each of the moons and planets, we've got sort of consistent, sort of the same, not the same, but similar uh, science objectives, right? Composition properties, composition properties, internal structure, uh, composition properties, internal structure. These are great white spot. That's that's kind of, you know, weather, that's that's properties of, of an atmosphere, really, the specialized atmosphere. North Pole, that's still, that's properties of the atmosphere. Uh, so, and then rings or composition properties. So we got lots of composition and properties, some internal structure. We've got some magnetic field stuff. We've got uh, heat. That's a big deal. Heat and heat flow, temperature and heat flow. So there's, there's some basic categories of these science objectives. Now what we've done on the next slide is we've uh, uh, grouped those categories together so that they're easier to see. So the first thing you want to do is say, okay, which of these moons or planets interests, interests us the most? Are we interested in Venus, Rhea, Dion, Saturn, or Enceladus? Which interests us the most? And then once you decide on that as a team, okay, this should be a team thing. Once you're, or as, if your teacher tells you to, that's different too. 
Once you decide on what is the most interesting thing for you, then you go and you say, okay, or, or which place is the most interesting? Then you go, what about this place is most interesting? What do we, you know, if we're going to look at uh, Rhea, what about Rhea is most interesting? I think Rhea is just a neat name. <laughs> and Dion sounds like a rock group to me. I was like, Dion, raw. So, um, uh, what, you know, if you choose Ray or Dion, what about one of these two places interests you? Is it the rings? Is it the internal structure? What is, you know, the, remember, the great debate, remember, you don't, you don't, you, you gotta choose a side. You can't just, it's like Bama or Auburn, you gotta choose a side. So, um, uh, so once you choose the planet or the moon, then you say, okay, what about that place interests us the most? And that's how you sort of narrow down, you keep dialing down on your science objective. Um, and you want to do this as a team because it affects the entire, it impacts the entire team. Uh, so here's the categories again. We have atmospheric um, properties and composition, surface properties and composition. Very similar there. That's why I have this aerial drum between them. The difference between soil, uh, surface, you can do soil mechanics, you can do surface mechanics. Um, you know, how, how uh, hard is the surface? How, um, uh, how penetrable is the surface? There's penetrability numbers, there's hardness numbers that are associated with soils. You can't do that with an atmosphere because it's all just, you know, it's, that's, that's called viscosity, basically. Um, but uh, what happens in, you know, what, what happens when you hit the surface with something? You know, how does it, you know, how, how fast does it slow down? You know, what are the accelerations? So there's things that are specific to soils, to surfaces that you can't do with atmospheres, but there's properties and composition are the same. Biologicals are just a specialized composition thing. And then we have internal structure and tectonics. You can do that at Rhea Down and Enceladus. Temperature and heat flow, you can do at the Tiger Stripes. You can do probably at Rhea and Dione um, if you wanted to, but uh, it's, it'll be more interesting at Enceladus. Um, and then radiation and magnetic fields, Enceladus and Tiger Stripes. You can do it at Rhea and Dione also, but it, uh, again, it's more interesting at Enceladus, uh, the magnetic field interaction. So those are our categories. Now, what I'm going to now for the rest of the presentation, basically we're going to go through and talk about these categories. We've grouped atmospheric and surface science together because properties and composition. Basically, we talk about what is a property, how do you measure properties, what does composition mean, how do you measure compositions, and then what does internal structure mean, how do you measure internal structure, what does temperature and heat flow mean, how do you measure it, and then what is radiation and magnetic fields, what are they, how do you measure them. Um, that's the rest of this presentation.